For the previous few videos, we have looked at digital controller design by emulation. With this design approach, we first design an analog controller to control the analog plant, and then we discretize the controller. In today's video, we illustrate this approach by working through an example. We use the continuous time root locus to design an analog controller, we discretize the controller using five different discretization methods, and we compare the responses of the resultant digital control systems. The plant for this control system is a frictionless pendulum with mass m, length l, angle theta, which is also the output, and torque input t u. The pendulum model is linearized around the upright position, so we are looking at the inverted pendulum model. For an arbitrary set of parameters, the transfer function from the torque input to the angle output is given by 1 over s squared minus 4. So this plant has a stable pole at minus 2 and an unstable pole at 2. The specifications for the control system is that the dominant poles should be optimally damped and the closed loop bandwidth should be 2.83 radians per second, which is determined by the natural frequency of the dominant closed loop poles. The plant should be controlled by a digital controller. We can see the digital control system configuration here on the right. The plant input is the analog signal U of T. The plant model is the continuous transfer function G of S. The output is the analog signal Y of T, which is sampled every T seconds, subtracted from the digital reference input signal R of K, which forms the input to the controller. The output of the controller is put through a zero-order hold circuit to form the plant input. Our goal is to design a digital controller in the form of a discrete time transfer function D of Z, such that the control system satisfies the specifications. For this example, we are going to use a sampling period of 0.1 seconds. Let's look at whether this is an appropriate choice. With a sampling period of 0.1 seconds, the sampling frequency is 62.8 radians per second. This means that the Nyquist frequency is 31.4 radians per second, which is approximately 10 times higher than the closed loop bandwidth of the control system. With the chosen sampling frequency, we can therefore represent all the frequency components within the closed loop bandwidth. However, since the Nyquist frequency is relatively close to the closed loop bandwidth, we expect the approximations we make in the controller discretizations not to be very accurate. The first step in digital controller design by emulation is to design an analog controller, which we will do using the root locus. Since we know that the combination of sampling and zero-order hold in the digital control system introduces a half sampling period delay, we can incorporate this delay into the plant model with the Bade approximation as shown here, before we do the controller design. We call this augmented plant model G prime of S, and our aim is now to design an analog controller DA of S for this plant. Alternatively, we can omit the Pate approximation and design an analog controller for the original plant model as shown here. For this alternative configuration, the plant model is simpler and the controller design is therefore also simpler to do. However, since we omit the delay caused by the sample and hold, the response of the digital control system will differ more from the designed response of the analog control system. From the specifications on the previous page, we can easily calculate the desired location of the dominant closed loop poles to be at minus 2 plus minus j2. We use the plant model augmented with the Pate approximation, which is written out here. For this example, we draw the root locus by hand. However, in practice, you would almost always use numerical software packages to do the root locus design. Let's first try a proportional controller. With a proportional controller, the root locus will be given as shown here in green. There is a locus on the real axis between the poles at minus 2 and 2, which breaks away around the origin of the S-plane. This part of the root locus bends into the right half plane. There is also a locus to the left of the pole at minus 20. The desired dominant closed loop poles are shown in blue. It is clear that the locus will not pass through the desired closed loop poles and a proportional controller will therefore not work. A lead controller is often used to move the root locus towards the left half plane. This is exactly what we want, so we try a lead controller next. 
The structure of the lead controller is shown here, with the pole at minus A located to the left of the zero at minus B, and the controller gain given by KD. We arbitrarily choose the controller zero to cancel the plant pole at minus two. There is no specific reason why we should do this, but it simplifies our calculations somewhat, which is nice. We now have to choose the location of the controller pole such that the root locus passes through the desired closed loop pole locations and then choose the controller gain to place the dominant closed loop poles in the desired locations. The angles between the open loop poles and one of the closed loop poles are shown in orange. We determine the controller pole by using the angle condition. The angle of the loop transfer function evaluated at one of the desired closed loop poles should be minus 180 degrees plus an integer multiple of 360 degrees. The angle at minus 2 plus 2j is given by minus phi 1 minus phi 2 minus phi 3. We write the angle phi 2 in terms of the unknown value a. After we solve for a, we see that the controller pole should be located at minus 7.429. Next, we place the dominant closed loop poles in the desired locations by determining the controller gain with the magnitude condition. The magnitude condition says that the magnitude of the loop transfer function at one of the closed loop poles should be equal to 1. After substituting the plant transfer function and our chosen controller transfer function, we find the controller gain to be 23.43. Our desired analog controller is therefore given by this transfer function, which has a 0 at minus 2, a pole at minus 7.429 and a gain of 23.43. Our next aim is to find a digital controller that behaves similarly to this analog controller. The second step in digital controller design by emulation is to discretize the designed analog controller. Since there is no exact way to discretize an analog controller, we have to make some approximations. We have looked at five different approximate discretization methods before, and we will use all of them to discretize our designed controller. The first discretization method is impulse invariant discretization. The discrete time transfer function is given by the Z-transform of the designed continuous time transfer function. Remember that this is an informal way to write that the continuous time transfer function should be converted to the continuous time domain, then sampled, then converted to the Z-domain. We substitute our designed controller transfer function and split it up into a constant and a transfer function with fewer zeros than poles, so that we can use Laplace and Z-transform tables. However, there is no Z-transform entry corresponding to a constant continuous time transfer function. We can see the reason for this by converting the constant transfer function to a time signal, which corresponds to a continuous time impulse. Sampling a continuous time impulse is undefined, which means that this designed analog controller has no impulse invariant discrete time form. To apply the idea of impulse invariant discretization to such a case, one could use the more sophisticated matched pole zero method. However, we do not cover it in this module. The second discretization method is step invariant discretization. The discrete time transfer function is given by 1 minus z to the minus 1 times the z-transform of the designed continuous time transfer function divided by s. After performing partial fraction expansion, using the Laplace and z-transform tables, combining the two terms and some manipulation, we arrive at this result. Instead of doing this calculation by hand, one could also use MATLAB C to D function with the argument ZOH. The third discretization method is numerical integration using the forward rectangular rule. The discrete time transfer function is given by the design continuous time transfer function with every occurrence of s replaced by z minus 1 divided by the sampling period. After performing this substitution and some simple manipulation, we arrive at this result. The fourth discretization method is numerical integration using the backward rectangular rule. The discrete time transfer function is given by taking every occurrence of s in the design continuous time transfer function and replacing it by z minus 1 divided by the sampling period and z. After this substitution and some manipulation, we arrive at this result. 
The fifth and last discretization method is numerical integration using the trapezoid rule, also called the bilinear transform or distance rule. We obtain the discrete time transfer function by replacing every occurrence of s by 2 divided by the sampling period times z minus 1 divided by z plus 1. When performing this substitution and doing some manipulations, we arrive at this transfer function. We can arrive at the same result using the MATLAB command C2D with the argument Dustin. We have now calculated four digital controllers that each approximate the designed analog controller, each using its own approximation. Let's now simulate the responses of these digital controllers and compare them against each other as well as to that of the designed analog controller. In this figure, we show the simulated unit step responses of the different control systems with the step applied at one second. The blue plot is the response of the analog control system with the sample and hold delay modeled by a per day approximation. This is the designed response and it appears to be optimally damped as desired. The orange plot is the response of the analog control system but without the sample and hold delay. We can see that it predicts a more damped response than the model with the delay. The rest of the plots are the simulated responses of the different digital control systems. The green plot is that of the step invariant discretization. The red plot is that of the forward rectangular rule. The purple plot that of the backward rectangular rule. And the brown plot that of the bilinear transform. It is clear that the responses of the discretized controllers are noticeably different from each other and that of the designed analog controller. One reason for this is that the sampling frequency is relatively low compared to the closed loop bandwidth, which means that the effect of the approximations are significant. Another reason is that the controller design is partly based on pole zero cancellation. Since the mapping of poles and zeros from the S-plane to the Z-plane differ between the discretization methods, the controller zero is mapped to different locations, the plant pole at minus 2 would not be cancelled perfectly anymore, and the actual close to poles could therefore be in significantly different locations. It is difficult to make any conclusions about whether any of the discretization methods are better than the others. A good approach is to evaluate several discretization methods and choose the one that performs the best for the specific application. It is clear that none of the digital control systems satisfy the specifications. For a practical control system, one would repeatedly visit the controller design until the closed loop response is satisfactory, but for this example, we stop here. Lastly, note that the steady state error between the output and reference input is significant. For this example, where the pendulum should be balanced at an angle of 0 degrees, this is not an issue. However, for other applications, the steady state error might be unacceptable and could require a redesign of the analog controller. We have said that one of the main reasons for the difference in response between the designed analog controller and the discretized controllers is that the sampling frequency is relatively low. Let's look at how the responses change when we increase the sampling frequency. When we double the sampling frequency, we obtain the plot shown in this figure. The analog controller design is unchanged and we redid the discretization with the new sampling period. The meaning of the colors are the same as for the previous figure. The first thing we can see is that the analog controllers with and without the sample and hold delay modeled respond more similarly than previously. The second thing we can see is that the responses of the discretized controllers are much closer to each other and that of the designed analog controller. This shows that if one increases sampling frequency, the effect of the approximations made by the discretization methods become less pronounced. In conclusion, we have seen that digital controller design by emulation is a straightforward process where we design an analog controller using familiar continuous time techniques such as the root locus. We then discretize the controller by using any of the available discretization methods. However, these discretization methods make approximations and they require the sampling frequency to be relatively high compared to the closed loop bandwidth for the approximations to be accurate. If the sampling frequency cannot be made high enough, or if accurate behavior is required, then one might rather choose direct digital design, which is the topic of the next part of the module.